In this video, we're going to talk about some tools that we really don't like to recommend. They're a first, uh, what's referred to as aversive training tools. Now, uh, modern dog training has evolved. Um, when I was a little kid, if I got in trouble, I got spanked. If I got did something good, I got an attaboy. Um, dog tra and then now parents know, well, that spanking creates frustration, lowers self-esteem, it creates confidence issues. So now parents incorporate timeouts and come up with uh, more structured ways of dealing with situations instead of punishing their child. Most people, I think if you would ask your uh, parent, if you had to punish the child, do you feel good about that? Most people are gonna say no. I kind of look at the same thing for dog training. Uh, the title is dog trainer, not dog punisher. So if you wanna use a trainer and they want to use aversive training methods, I think that's an indication they're not very good at their job. So I'm gonna show, uh, I'm gonna go over a couple of them that uh, are very commonly used and explain where the premise is, why uh, we recommend that you would stay away from them and the potential fallback uh, or fallout of using these issues, using these things. Now, one of the first ones I'm going to talk about is uh, what's referred to as a pinch or prong collar. I've got two examples of it. Uh, basically, it goes around your dog's head, and, and just like a collar does, and you see there are little, uh, essentially, prongs that actually bite into your dog. Now, these go around the dog's head, and I've talked to trainers who use, uh, or balanced trainers are people who punish your dogs. That's, they don't want to say, I punish dogs, they say balance. So I think that's pretty telling if you don't want to describe what you do accurately, you have to come up with code words, that's probably an indication you're not very proud of what you're doing. I've talked to people like, oh, if you use a certain type of one, BS. This is really, I look at it as a torture device. Now where this comes from is when puppies are little, uh, their mother will, because she doesn't have hands, will pick the puppies up and move them around with her mouth. Well, these people said, well, she's biting and correcting them with her teeth. And although some mothers do bite and correct their puppies, it is the mother, she gave birth, you did not. And also she knows how sensitive she needs to do it. One study that I read talked about how they observed a number of litters of puppies and they counted the amount of time that the mother actually spent with her mouth around those puppies and the entire whelping period, which is the period the puppy has spends with its mother and siblings before they go away to the next home, it was less than 60 seconds the entire time her mother was biting. You put this on your dog and go for a walk, it's the entire walk. Now, one of the big drawbacks of this is it starts releasing cortisol, the stress hormone, into your dog's blood. So, um, and I, you know, if you just simply put this around your neck, it wouldn't feel very good. Now, this was, uh, I brought two examples of this because this one, you can see the tips don't have anything on them. They're just silver. This one has little condoms on the tips. You know why they have little condoms on the tips? Because these often penetrate the skin, and I've seen dogs where it actually destroys and damages their trachea. So there's a lot of potential damage for this. Now, ideally for these, uh, or not ideally, because I don't think that you should ever use them for any circumstances whatsoever. If you have to use this because your dog's so out of balance, you put your dog in a situation where it's just not prepared for it. Uh, I argued with one person who was saying, well, when I go to these barn hunts, my dog is so out of control, it's the only way I can control my dog. Maybe your dog shouldn't be doing a barn hunt. If your dog is practicing anything that I can't, can't control itself, if I have a human, I don't like say, well, I'm gonna put you in a straight jacket before I take you to the casino. It's ridiculous, it's the same sort of thing, except for this causes a lot of pain and discomfort. Now dogs also learn through repetition, consistency, and good timing. You have about two seconds to correct or reward a dog, and association is a big part of how they learn. So let's say that uh, I'm Fido, I'm walking down the street, and I'm feeling really good, and I see Addie over here, and Addie is a great person who always has treats for me, and I'm excited to see her, and this is the first time I'm wearing a prong collar, but I'm excited to see Allie, so what do I do? I lunge towards her because I'm excited, I'm happy to see her. It bites me in the neck. Whatever I'm looking at, when it bites me in the neck, was where I perceive that negative association came from. So it changes me from thinking Addie is a good, positive person that has treats for me, is Addie is a punisher. Or Addie, and when I go towards Addie, I am punished for that. After time, I find that this creates a ticking time bomb. Eventually, that your dog, that dog is off leash one day and sees Addie, and it's been bit in the neck 120 times over walks over the course of a year, and I'm off leash, and Addie does something I don't like or that surprises me. I might go over there and nip and, and or, or do worse. Um, also, I find that it really doesn't stop dogs from most dogs from pulling. They just learn to pull in a different, more torquey way. Um, we have videos which we've shot here for our puppy classes, and we have trainers who are happy to go to your house and teach you positive reinforcement ways to get your dog to walk with you uh, without having to use a punishment-based device. Like I said, the title is Dog Trainer, not Dog Punisher. 
Now, another one that's very commonly used, uh, actually, before I get to this one, they also have something called a choke chain. This is a chain that goes around your dog's neck, and it's designed that when your dog pulls it, it's prevent, supposedly it prevents them from actually choking itself. But it's also a punishment-based tool. I've seen dog's skin get caught in there. It's, again, something that I see a lot of people pulling and jerking the dog. Um, it's just really not a good thing to do. It's gonna create a negative association, and I can't tell you how many clients I've had whose dogs suddenly just say, I don't wanna walk anymore, because it's not any fun for them. The walk should be enjoyable. Anything your dog does should be enjoyable. And if you're using a device that basically stops the dog's behavior because it's correcting the dog or causing it discomfort, it's not gonna enjoy whatever that particular activity is. So um, actually, before I get to this one, one other one, this is called a slip lead. Now this is uh, basically, it's uh, a round leash and it's got a little thing with uh, just really a little, uh, I don't know what you would call it, just a circle that it goes through. You slip the dog's head over it and it can actually choke the dog. This is something really you'd only use maybe if you're in a dog show and your dog walks in a perfect heel and you have to have a leash. You should never use this for a dog that pulls on the walk. As a matter of fact, if your dog pulls on the walk and it's having, even if it has a flat collar, it can collapse dog's trachea. That's something that's not, often not repairable and your dog will sound like it has a cold or a hoarse cough for the rest of its life. It can impede how it breathes. It's a serious problem that you also want to avoid. If you have a dog that's fearful, the last thing you want to use is a punishment-based tool. They're already scared. I promise you, you're going to make their fears much worse. Additionally, dogs that are fearful, if you have a collar, that can contribute to their fear if you're pulling them, even if they're not pulling them, just that tension on the collar or on their neck. So if you do have a fearful dog, I would recommend you get a harness. Now for harnesses, you don't want to get what's known as a T harness, one that goes across here in a T shape. You want one that's an X or a Y shape here. There's a whole bunch of them out there. If you don't know a good one, ask your puppy class instructor. We're happy to instruct you uh, to give you some suggestions. Or you can just do a Google search for X or Y shaped uh, harnesses. They're going to be much better for your dog. They're not going to impede its gait. And you can remove that frustration or anxiety or fear based uh, issues that are coming from a neck uh, collar. Um, also, don't use a collar that is, I've seen people that literally use a chain because it looks tough on my pit bull. Well, that can also cause some damage for your dog. You know, we don't have metal-based, uh, you know, corrective devices that, for humans because it's painful and it can cause real damage to your dog. So uh, make sure you're using an appropriate uh, collar or leash. And for collars, make sure the collar, you should always be able to get at least two fingers between the collar and your dog's skin pretty easily. If not, that can be too tight for them. If you have a husky or a dog that has a bigger neck and a smaller head, I would recommend getting what's called a martingale or a no-slip collar. Those are collars that can be nice and loose, except for when you, there's tension on leash, it uh, has an extra loop that collapses and that actually makes it tight. Tighter. So dogs that uh, do have are escape artists, that's the sort of uh, collar I would recommend. If you do have a dog that's uh, uh, wearing a harness, it's often easy for them to escape. What If you're holding a leash at this camera and I want to get out of as a dog, what I usually do is I backwards and it kind of slides it off of the collar, off of the dog. There are different types of harnesses that actually prevent that a little bit, but uh, if you do see your dog doing that, you might want to kind of relax leash walk towards them, or you might combine it with a martingale collar where you clip it to the martingale and to the, uh, the harness. For a harness, we would prefer to have a harness that clips in the front as opposed to the back. Dogs have something called an opposition reflex. If it's in the back and I'm pulling, well, I'm gonna get more pulls. Uh, I'm gonna pull more intensely if you're pulling directly opposite me. If you put it here, it's kind of turning the dog to the side. It's a little bit more management, but it's better for your dog. Uh, all right, so the other one that people use very commonly is a shock collar. And uh, basically a shock collar has these two little electrodes that have to be touching your dog's skin at all times in order for those uh, for the current to con complete the circuit. So it starts, goes into your dog, and then it comes back through your dog and goes here. That means the entire time that this is on, that your puppy is wearing it, or your adult dog, it is coursing through their body. Now, uh, I had a dog named Farley that I lost, unfortunately, and Farley liked to eat scat. He also has a, was a stone former, so he was not supposed to eat certain proteins, including scat. And so this is before I did this for a living, and so I got him a shock collar. I maybe shocked him three or four times total. Um, the rest of the time he was just wearing it, and I had my finger on the trigger in case so I could deter him from eating scat. Well, there's a lot of different ways you can teach your dogs to do that. A real easy one is just simply make sure you pick up the scat as soon as it's done. But um, what I found late in life is if I went to touch Farley, he would jump because it's running that electricity through their body the whole time, which is not a natural thing, and it creates problems with their system. I can't tell you how bad I felt personally that my buddy that I'm supposed to look out for jumped every time I reached to give him a tender touch late in life because I made a real critical mistake as a dog guardian. I'm hoping that you don't make that same mistake. 
There's another type of uh, collar that I see a lot of people use, especially for dogs that pull on a leash, called a halty. A halty is a collar, and then it well, actually is a collar that has another loop that comes up and it wraps around their snout. Now, one study I read talked about the snout of a dog's nose is as sensitive as the most sensitive part of your or my body. I probably wouldn't be in too good a mood if you put something that pinched that and then handed it to somebody like Zach here. So what I'd like you to do is to think about it kind of in that perspective. Another really dangerous part of that device is your puppy is wearing it. If they snap their head at the wrong time, they can break their neck. It's also going to cause pain and discomfort. And again, that's not what your puppy wants. That's, uh, I want you to think about why is your dog listening to you? Is your dog listening to you because it fears a punishment or a reprisal? Ask yourself, if you go through life and that's how you operate your job, I'm worried the boss is gonna fire me. Are you enjoying your job? Are you feeling confident in your job? Or are you waiting for that other shoe to drop? And so again, ask yourself, why do I want my dog to listen to me? If you use positive reinforcement and modern dog training, which is force-free like we use, your dog actually likes to do the activity that you do because you taught them how to do it, you rewarded them for doing what you wanted, and so the dog has the same motivation as you do. I've worked with over 4,000 dogs. Professionally, I've never had to use any of these devices for dogs. So if you deal with the trainer and say, oh, that, your dog has to have one. BS. No dog deserves to be punished. Uh, part of our mandate is to always be the dog's advocate. We want you to be your dog's advocate. Unfortunately, there's a training company here in Omaha that actually has eight-week-old puppies wearing shock collars for their puppy classes. If you hire a trainer that wants to use any of these tools, find somebody else. If you're thinking about going to, with the trainer, look at their website. Do they have pictures of dogs wearing these tools? Do they have descriptions of equipment? If they do and they list these tools, Find somebody else. Um, other things you want to avoid are something called alpha rolls, which is something that people, uh, the monks of New Skeet used to use, and a lot of trainers did, which was, I'm gonna pin the dog down until it submits. A lot of people end up getting their nose bit by the dog uh, for doing this. And again, you're terrorizing your dog. And if you want your dog to cower and pot piddle when you reach for it, those are great things to do. There's no reason you should ever alpha roll your dog. Create a situation where your dog has a couple of options. Some of the options are not really very interesting for your dog, and the one that you want gets a reward. It doesn't take very long for your puppy to start automatically choosing the thing that you want. And after practicing enough, that becomes what we call an established behavior. Your puppy automatically wants to walk in the heel position or next to you with a loose leash because I get a treat every time I do that. At first for one step, two step, three steps, we've got videos we're happy to share with you. So if you have a puppy or an adult dog, I would ask you to please avoid using any sort of aversive training tool or method. Uh, if you're unsure about it, ask your instructor. We're happy to explain, uh, to well, look into it and we'll give you an explanation of whether that's an aversive tool or not, and if it is, why it's a bad thing to use, but I think this video does a pretty good job of explaining why you should stay away from aversive forms of training. Quest, you are a goofball.